a most wonderful evening. Beloved Bushy, we have a really extra special treat. And just to explain the treat in its context, first we need to talk about the journey uh, that we've been on over the last um, couple of weeks. Remember the premise, um, remember, remember, remember how all this started. Unfortunately, there, there's been an, there was an escalation um, both in Eretz Israel and in Israel in terms of um, of a really difficult time, um, a really diff difficult period um, of escalation of violence there, plus um, how it affected us in the diaspora in terms of the anti-Semitism all of us have felt. And we really wanted a response. We really wanted um, to to call out our, our feelings of, of, of the hurt that we were having for what was happening both in Israel and in the diaspora. And the response that we chose was what I consider to be an extremely appropriate one. Instead of going to responding to our um, to to those who would say that we are wrong, instead we choose to um, to raise our heads up very high and and show our Israeli pride, and we create the dear to dream um, stories of of um, of true heroism um, in modern times of our country where we can hold our heads up high of saying we're so proud to be Zionists, so proud to believe in Israel, and so proud um, to um, wherever we are to um, to recognize that Israel will always be um, our spiritual um, and, um, and our people's homeland. And this really brings us to this evening. Uh, Rafi Berg um, is a, a personal friend of mine um, and uh, I'm sure he would like to think that the that the inspiration behind um, the story that he's going to tell comes from him. I would like to think that it might be a bit of a shared um, inspiration. I remember uh, a uh, a discussion that we had probably in um in was a Chumas bar um, all those years ago, in which you which in which Rafi outlined the, his uh, his new venture um, to look into this amazing story of Ethiopian Jews, and he was going to take a sabbatical to be able to to dedicate time towards it, um, and uh, I, I was so excited because I knew um, that with Rafi um, behind the helm, the story was going to come to life. And it really, really has. Uh, and and um, hopefully what we're going to hear, um, the amazing experiences um, which took place saving the Ethiopian Jews, um, not only will be inspiration for uh, how, um, what, what our people did to save brothers and sisters, but also a reminder about our own um, eternal connection that we have to those who we may not know, whom we may not even speak their language, but they are a part of Am Yisrael, part of our people. An all part of the story um, of um, the Red Sea um, spies and handing over to my good friend Rafi, who will share um, this experience with all of us this evening. Rafi Berg, over to you. Hello. Well, thank you very much indeed. I was really, really excited when you offered me the opportunity to uh, speak to your community this evening. Um, especially under the title of the series, uh, Dare to Dream, True Stories of Jewish Israeli Heroism. I, I did a talk on this uh, quite recently on this subject, and um, one of the questions which I was asked was, what was the most surprising thing I, I found out when I wrote the, the book Red Sea Spies, which is, which is the true story of, of, of the events which I'm going to talk about? And I was kind of caught a little bit off guard and I gave an answer. And then it, it occurred to me afterwards that, that, that it wasn't the answer which I, I should have given. Um, hopefully, if I remember by the end of the talk, I'll tell you what the answer was that I gave. But I want to start off by giving the answer that I should have given. And, and that is the surprise, the thing which surprised me most about this story is that I didn't already know about it. Researching the book took me on an incredible journey of discovery. And it is the, the true heroes of the story isn't really the Mossad, it's the Ethiopian Jews. And I was quite astonished that I'd reached this stage in life uh, with a bank of knowledge about Israel and Judaism, which I'm quite proud of, but with almost no knowledge at all about the Ethiopian Jewish community. I paid scant interest uh, to them and, you know, treated them with apathy and disinterest. But what I learned when I was 
investigating to piece this book together is that if you want to know about heroism and bravery and Zionism, and I don't mean the Zionism that we all practice and adhere to, modern Zionism, but Zionism which predates the Theodore Herzl, you have to look towards the Ethiopian Jews. The, the, there's a, a lady called uh, Michal Avera Samuel, and uh, she's Ethiopian, uh, lives in Israel now. She came to Israel during one of the uh, one of the operations, not not the operation which I'm going to talk about, but I think she actually came during Operation Moses, which was kind of a well-known airlift, which took place in the end of 1984 to 1985. And uh, she wrote in the, uh, the Times of Israel, uh, about her experiences and growing up in Ethiopia. And it kind of puts it into a little bit of perspective, what, what she wrote and about what it meant to be an Ethiopian Jew, uh, cut off from the rest of uh, mainstream, the rest of the Jewish diaspora in its entirety. And she says this, up until the age of nine, I lived in a world where the Beta Migdash, the holy temple in Jerusalem actually existed. Like my parents and teachers, I believed that the second temple stood in its place in Jerusalem and was literally made of pure gold. I grew up hearing about the Kohanim, the holy priests, and how they worked in the temple. I fell asleep listening to stories about the halo hovering over Jerusalem and about Jews who merited to dwell in the holy city, cloaked in white garments, people blessed with pure hearts, clean thoughts and devoid of sin. Overhead, I would imagine the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, as angels. Deep within Ethiopia, my family and I, along with our neighbours from the Better Israel community, hoped to merit to return to Jerusalem one day. We prayed and performed customs that expressed our yearning for Zion. When we slaughtered livestock, we would turn the animals' heads towards Jerusalem, and whenever we noticed a flock of storks above our fields, we would chant a song in which we requested that the birds that the birds deliver our prayers, the hope to return to our homeland. The premise of the story is the return of Ethiopian Jews to the land of Israel. And I don't know whether you're familiar with a movie which uh, came out on Netflix uh, a year or two back called The Red Sea Diving Resort, but it purports to tell the story of how the Mossad, uh, acting undercover in Sudan, spirited Ethiopian Jews uh, from there to Israel. And these are events which took place in the early 1980s. So on the one hand, the Mossad is our heroes, inevitably and questionably. But what I learned was that the, the real heroes of the story isn't really the Mossad, it's the Ethiopian Jews and what they went through to get back to their ancestral homeland. And this is actually how the Mossad sees it. They, they, they consider themselves having lent a hand uh, to have been a, a bridge over which the Jews ultimately crossed to get back to the land of Israel. Where the movie went wrong was to depict these events as, as a series of events involving white saviors coming to res rescue the, uh, the, the helpless Jews, but it really wasn't that at all. I'll go on to explain why. So to put it in a nutshell, the premise of the story is that these events occurred early 1980s and the Mossad used a fake diving resort as cover in Sudan to smuggle Ethiopian Jews uh, out of Sudan and onto Israel. And this took place over, over a period of years. But to begin with, we need to understand who the Ethiopian Jews are. Well, their origins are shrouded in obscurity and there's debate even to this present day among scholars and historians and academics as to how the Jews arrived in Ethiopia and whether they're genuinely Jewish. Well, before all this started in my life, you know, when I, perhaps when I thought about Ethiopian Jews, I'd wonder how Jewish were they? Did, were they just a tribe that practiced some Jewish rituals or not? But it's it's not even really a question which needs to be asked because uh, it's been long established by Jewish sages, the greatest sages of their day, 
the Radbas and Castro, the chief rabbis of Egypt in the Middle Ages, they identified Ethiopian Jews as halachically Jewish. Ethiopian Jews go back in history as far as we do. They belonged to the tribe of Dan. There's a, an abundance of theories and hypotheses as to where they came from, but it's long been accepted that they are part of the tribe of Dan and that they peeled off from the children of Israel as far back as perhaps after just after the reign of King Solomon, when the, the Solomonic kingdom split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah and the tribe of Dan, so it said, according to tradition, didn't want to participate in what became a civil war. So they left the land of Israel and resurfaced in Ethiopia. There's another theory that Ethiopian Jews are one of the 10 lost tribes who were taken into captivity when the Assyrians conquered the Northern Kingdom in the eighth century. There's a quite a fantastic legend, which was actually believed by Ethiopian Christians to this day, that the Jews of Ethiopia uh, the descendants of a relationship between the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon, and that uh, the Queen of Sheba bore a son to King Solomon, the son was called Menelik, who was the first emperor, first uh, ruler rather of Ethiopia, and that he went to, <coughs> excuse me, he went to visit his father in Jerusalem, and on his way uh, back to Aksum, which is in present day Ethiopia, when he left Jerusalem, he stole the Ark of the Covenant spirited it back to, uh, schlepped it back to Aksum, uh, along with a retinue of foot soldiers, Jewish foot soldiers from, from the Holy Temple, and that Ethiopian Jews are the descendants of these foot soldiers. And by the way, e Ethiopian Orthodox Christians maintain that the, that, uh, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant uh, to this day resides in a chapel in Aksum. Uh, you can look up YouTube clips of it, they bring it out once a year undercover. They don't take the cover off, you can't see it. But for many centuries, Jews actually flourished in Ethiopia. They lived in the highlands and believe it or not, they had a, a kingdom which lasted for a thousand years. A king, the kingdom of Semyon, it was called. And it waxed and it waned until the 1600s when uh, during a series of uh, wars, they were ultimately uh, defeated. They were conquered by Christian Ethiopian uh, emperor, uh, ruler of the day. And Ethiopian Judaism went into decline. At the end of the, towards the end of the 19th century, Christian missionaries started to practice in Ethiopia and they targeted uh, Jewish Ethiopians as easy prey. Now, when word got back to uh, the, the communities, Jewish communities in Europe, that there was a, a little known Jewish tribe in Ethiopia, they questioned what to do about it. And there was a, uh, a Jewish philanthropic organization in Paris, which uh, dispatched one of its uh, scholars to go and find this mysterious Jewish tribe. His name was uh, Joseph Halevi. He was originally Polish uh, and he studied in France and he was dispatched from France. And he, he made contact with the Ethiopian Jews in roughly 1870 and maybe a year or two out. And he was the first Jewish outsider to make contact with Ethiopian Jews for, well, I'd say forever, for 2,000, two and a half thousand years. At that point in time, this is as recently as the late 19th century, Ethiopian Jews thought they were the last representatives of Judaism on planet Earth. They didn't know there was any such thing as non-black Jews. Now, when Joseph Halevi introduced himself as a white Jewish person, they took no interest in him because they thought he was an imposter. They thought he was a, a missionary come to convert them. 
and he writes in the um, I have to keep my eye on the time here because um, there's a lot of ground to cover I don't want to get carried away but it's it's really the most astonishing story I've spoken about it so many times but even even now I get um, you know uh, over enthusiastic about it he writes in his travel log about what it was like when he met what what happens rather when he when he mentioned the word the, the name of Jerusalem to these villagers he, he describes it in, in florid terms how all at once the atmosphere changed and the villagers surrounded him and they started bombarding him with questions about what's Jerusalem like have you been there is it a city paved with gold and he explained to them that it's long been conquered that the, the temples no longer standing it's not the place that they think it is and he describes how they were absolutely crestfallen because you have to understand to Ethiopian Jews Jerusalem was absolutely everything it's what sustained them it was in their daily prayers it was in their the stories that they pass from father to son from grandfather to grandson you can read about it and it was this ancestral longing to return to what they called the land of Jerusalem. They didn't call Israel the land of Israel. It was the land of Jerusalem. It was this ancestral longing which sustained them down the centuries. This hope that they lived in that their generation would be the one to fulfill the, uh, the prophecies, the prophecy of Isaiah, the ingathering of the exiles, including the, the Cush. Isaiah, Isaiah writes about the ingathering of the people from Cush. If, uh, one thing which I, I picked up along the way is, you know, we think of ourselves as proper Jews, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Ashkenazi Jews. Many of us originate from Eastern Europe, from Poland. But if you stop and ask yourself, how, how many times does Poland appear in the Bible? Not many. How many times does Kush appear in the Bible? Very many. So it's unquestionably the association of the Jews of Ethiopia. Are, I mean, they're, they're, they're a biblical people. But fast forward to the 20th century, the establishment of the State of Israel, 1948. It was uh, part of the reason was to be a haven for Jews under threat around the world. And the law of return, which, uh, was, uh, which was introduced in 1950, applied to every Jew on earth. Every Jew had the right to settle in Israel, all bar Ethiopian Jews, because they weren't recognized as proper Jews by the Israeli interior ministry. It's astonishing. I, I even heard of a, an Ethiopian Jew who fought in the 1948 War of Independence. But Ethiopian Jews were disregarded by, by the new state of Israel. I say the new state, but it, it, it continued in this way until the 1970s. Israel had bigger problems to deal with than the fate of Ethiopian Jews. They had a relationship with the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, which was of vital importance to Israel. And the Jews were just one of a number of many minorities who lived in Ethiopia. And it wasn't, it wasn't considered the right thing to do to rock the boat, to try to pressure the Ethiopian emperor to let the Jews the, amongst other th other reasons as well, let, let the Jews leave. In the 1970s, there was a revolution in Ethiopia. Haile Selassie was swept aside and a new regime came to power. A hard left militaristic junta called the Derg. They were anti-religion, anti-Western, pro-Soviet and anti-Zionist. So things were looking bleak for Ethiopian Jews. The numbers at the height of the uh, centuries previously, in fact, not, not even centuries, maybe a century or two back, at the height, the number about uh, half a million, I believe. But by the late 1970s, there were as few as 36,000 Ethiopian Jews left in existence. They, they literally stood on the brink of extinction. But then in 77, a big change came about in Israel with the advent of a new prime minister, a prime minister who was 
not like any other prime minister who had preceded him for very many reasons. And we're talking about Menachem Begin. Begin saw no distinction between any kind of Jew in the world, black, white, anywhere in between. If you're Jewish, you're Jewish. You belong in the land of Israel. In his first transitional meeting with the then head of the Mossad, Yitzhak Hoffi, Begin gave him a number of instructions. One, continue with the operations that are already underway. Two, uh, work out a new set of missions. Three, bring me the Jews of Ethiopia. This was a command from the Prime Minister of Israel to bring to the state of Israel Ethiopian Jews. Now the, the Mossad, when we think about the Mossad, we think in terms of espionage, assassinations, cloak and dagger, uh, staying one step ahead of our enemies. But here the Mossad was being asked to act as a humanitarian organization. It wasn't structured in this way, but you can't turn around to the prime minister of Israel and say, sorry, no can do. The order was given, it had to be carried out. The Mossad, initially sent uh, one of its operatives to check out the feasibility of carrying out an operation in Ethiopia to extract the Jews from there. And the, the individual went, he was sm smuggled in, or rather he went under false pretenses. Incidentally, one of the people I tracked down from uh, during the course of my research for the book was the uh, he was then an, uh, an aid worker, this individual, and he, he worked for the ORT. You may be familiar with the, with the ORT, it's still very much around and, and, and active. And the ORT was a charitable organisation. It was the only foreign charity which was allowed to operate inside Ethiopia, because the Ethiopia by this stage was, uh, was, this was a paranoid regime which didn't trust foreigners. But the head of the ORT in Ethiopia was was a Jewish person. The Mossad uh, contacted him and he smuggled uh, the, well the, the name of the Mossad agent is Danny. He smuggled Danny into the country. Danny did a feasibility study and he reported back to Yitzhak Hoffi and he said it's impossible it can't be done. Uh, we don't know how many Ethiopian Jews are there that they live among scattered villages. There's civil war going on in Ethiopia. Every, there were 17 or 18 provinces in Ethiopia and every single one was in, a, in rebellion. And it was just far too dangerous. Not to, not to, to mention the fact that the Jews, <laughs> always to make things that little bit more awkward, they lived on mountainsides. You can't land a plane on a mountainside but it couldn't be done. So Mossad went back to the drawing board and at the weekly meetings with Menachem Begin, he would ask, he would say, no, how's the, how's the operation going? Hoffi would say, we're working on it, we're working on it. Then something quite miraculous happened. There comes and in, enters into the story, an Ethiopian Jew by the name of Feridea Klu, Faraday Aklum, he's a national hero among, and rightly so, among the Ethiopian Jewish community to this, to this very day. He was a Zionist. He wanted to move to Israel. He couldn't, he'd attempted it, but he was thwarted by, actually he was, or he almost made it in 1973, but he was thwarted at the last minute by the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War, which, which m meant he had to stay inside Ethiopia. So all this, by the way, is all in the book. It's far too much ground to cover. Um, but the book is literally an event, an, event, an event on every page because this is what the story is like. But because he was a Zionist, he became a wanted man. And the Ethiopian authorities uh, were after him and he had to flee for his life. He just had a newborn baby, by the way, just months old. He had to leave his wife and his baby. And he fled by foot from Ethiopia to Sudan. Sudan was the neighboring country. 
it was a treacherous journey over hundreds of miles. Faraday Aklum became the only Jew in Sudan. I think of it, this is Sudan. I mean, Sudan today, oh, okay, today it's, uh, it's, it's been split into Sudan and South Sudan, but uh, today it's not, it's not the kind of country where you want to probably want to go on a vacation. But in the 1970s, you can only use your imagination to imagine what the conditions were like for refugees there. And there were tens and tens of thousands of refugees who were fleeing the civil war in Ethiopia, flooding across the border, settling into refugee camps in Sudan. Among them was Faraday Aklum. He was the only Jew in Sudan. Sudan, the biggest country in Africa. One single Jew. And the Sudanese didn't look, didn't look favorably on Ethiopians either. So if you are an Ethiopian Jew, then it's twice as bad. Faraday sent a cryptic message to Jewish humanitarian organizations in Europe, which he, he knew about. He had the names and addresses actually. Uh, cryptic because he didn't want his telegram to fall into the wrong hands. And it basically said, uh, I am Faraday Klum. You know who I am. Uh, because he had previously had dealings with these organizations, send me an airplane ticket. And that was pretty much it. It was sent from a PO box in Khartoum, Khartoum Central Post Office. This cryptic message found its way to the Mossad and it landed on Danny's desk. And this was the opening. This was suddenly the key to the, uh, the problem that Mossad had not yet been able to crack. And the heads of the Mossad had a meeting, they got together. And they decided that if this one Jew had made it to, to, to Sudan, and Sudan was a flat land, no mountains, flat land. Perhaps they'd been thinking about Ethiopia wrongly and the place to extract the Jews from was Sudan and not Ethiopia. Sorry, my screen's just gone funny. Can you all still see me? Yes, we can. Is that your screen that you're sharing? No, uh, I didn't do anything. Uh, just a second. That's the rare boy. Okay, just let me get my gallery view back. There we go, that's fine. So, the Mossad decided that if they could get more Jews to follow in the footsteps of Faraday Klum, then they could collect them from Sudan and somehow smuggle them back to Israel. That was the, that was the, the thinking behind it, the theory. So Danny was dispatched to Sudan to find Faraday Klum with no information at all to go on other than a PO box, PO box number. So you know, to say this was like looking for a needle in a haystack, this is looking for a, for a black man in Sudan. It was next to impossible. But over a period of weeks using various methods and resourcefulness, Danny found Faraday. And I have to skip much of the detail here, but they got to know one another well. Uh, Danny didn't reveal at first, of course, that he himself was uh, he was an Israeli, but when they formed a bond, he revealed what the mission was and asked Faraday for his help. So between them, they got messages back to villagers in Ethiopia to say that Faraday was alive and that other members of his family should follow the route that he took to get to Sudan. This is what happened. First of all, Faraday's brothers made this this trek and they made it alive to Sudan and they sent more messages back to their home and others followed and it started as a trickle and there was great debate among the Ethiopian villagers in Ethiopia should we go shouldn't we go but the the impetus for the Jews in Ethiopia to make this odyssey was not to escape the deprivations of living in Ethiopia not to escape the war not to escape drought and the harshness, the unbelievably unbelievable difficulty of being a, of practicing Judaism in Ethiopia it wasn't to escape that. It was because 
they realized this was a gateway to fulfill this ancestral dream, finally to return to the land of Jerusalem and nothing was going to stand in their way. So this is where we talk about bravery and heroism. The bravery of what these people put themselves through is just absolutely astonishing. I mentioned that the Ethiopian Jews lived in the mountainsides. So put yourself in their position. These are Jews who'd lived there in their tukuls, in their, say tukuls, these are cylindrical mud hut homes with straw roofs, with their livestock. They'd lived there for centuries. And they left everything behind to make this journey, not knowing whether they'd survive or not. And it wasn't, you know, if we want to make a journey, we get into a car. These people had never seen electricity. This trek that they made was over hundreds of miles in the harshest conditions, up mountains, down mountains, through jungle, avoiding wild animals, not always avoiding wild animals, coming face to face with bandits, being pursued by non-Jewish villagers who hated the Jews. They, the non-Jews treated the Jewish and their Jewish neighbors with absolute disdain. The, the Jews were known actually as, as the hyena people. There was a superstition among Ethiopian Christians that at nighttime, the Jews would turn into hyenas and hunt down Christians and drink their blood. Just you know, similarity to the medieval uh, blood libel even reached Ethiopia in a form. So this, this, this odyssey that the Jews had to put them through themselves through was as harsh as you can imagine. 10% of all the Jews who set off to make this journey perished, 10%. That's approximately uh, about 1,500 Jews never made it. They died along the way. The Jews who set off, I heard, I've heard you know, an abundance of stories, they would take spades with them because they knew that members of their family wouldn't make it all the way. They'd have to, they'd have to dig graves in the desert to bury those who didn't make it. But many of them did make it and they gathered in refugee camps and continued practicing their Judaism, by the way, in the refugee camps where they couldn't let on to their, to the neighbors in the, in the neighboring tents that they were Jewish because they would be informed upon to the Sudanese secret police who were crawling around these refugee camps. And by the way, this, while they were making the journey by foot, uh, some of the journeys took weeks. It was never shorter than weeks. Some took months. On Shabbat, they paused. They wouldn't even walk on Shabbat. That is, that is how scrupulous they were in their observance of, of, of Judaism or their form of Judaism. To begin with, Danny and Faraday would collect the Jews undercover from the refugee camps, which was an ordeal in itself, and transport them by night to Khartoum Airport. This is a journey of about 300 miles. This is like the equivalent of going from London to Edinburgh by, by truck overnight, by Land Rover rather. And they would coach them in how to pass through an airport and the Jews would manage it. They'd be given doctored passports. They'd be put onto planes. The planes would fly to European destinations like Athens. There they'd be met by other representatives of the Mossad, put straight onto an El Al flight and then taken onwards to Israel. And this was the, how the operation began and the wheels started to be put in motion. And more and more Jews arrived, more and more Jews were gathered in the, in the refugee camps, uh, taken to safe houses in Khartoum, and then at the appropriate time they were taken from the safe houses and passed through Khartoum airport, um, masquerading as non-Jewish refugees, by the way. They reached a point where this 
uh, kind of operation was not going to be sustainable in the long term because of the, the number of Jews uh, arriving. They, 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 there were too many to, to, to do this form of, uh, of um, transportation. So the Mossad had to think of a parallel way to extract the Jews. And they looked at a map and they they saw that the Red Sea, of course, they'd know it was there. But the Red Sea is on the coast of Sudan. And it was decided that they would come up with some kind of a naval operation. So they said to Danny, go and check out the coast, find what it's like, what's the suitability like for, for landing a Navy, uh, a Navy ship there. And he did a recce at the coast. And this is where he stumbled across what is now known as quite famously as the Red Sea Diving Resort. And the resort, of course, only I mean, it enters the story halfway through. But it was an abandoned village which had operated as a hotel <clears throat> in the 1970s. And it was actually a partnership between an, a, 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 a uh, two Italian twins who had established this hotel and they partnered with the president of Sudan who wanted a share in it and it had, it had uh, functioned as a as a diving resort for uh, seven or eight years until the two sides fell out and the resort was abandoned but it was still standing it wasn't even derelict it was it was run down but it wasn't derelict and Danny checked out this place and he discovered that it belonged to the Sudanese Tourism Commission. There were no tourists in Sudan, by the way, but it still had a tourism commission. And he went to see the manager of the tourist office, the tourism commission, the director of the tourism commission. He in, Danny introduced himself as a European businessman. He said, I, I, I own a travel company. I specialize in diving holidays. I'd like to lease this resort from you. We could bring in tourists. This could be a fantastic thing. Of course, you know, he, this, he was speaking off the cuff. There was no tourist agency. He was, certainly wasn't a director, but it was, uh, you know, he was using uh, his, uh, his, uh, using his nows. Sudanese were very interested. Danny reported back to the Mossad. He said, look, you know, this, we, we can do this. He had to get clearance from uh, from Yitzhak Hoffi, the head of the Mossad. Uh, it was like it was a it was a harebrained scheme almost, but it was they realised that if the Mossad could take over this abandoned resort, they could use it as a base, as a permanent base, for a team of agents to supplement Danny operating Sudan, and with more people involved in the activity, then they could speed up the extraction of the Jews using this hotel as as the perfect cover and the Mossad went for it and they leased this resort from the Sudanese at a cost of about three hundred thousand dollars a year uh, during my research it was quite remarkable I saw the original documents the original handwritten notes that the Mossad had made when they'd uh, when they checked this place out what needed doing to it what needed what it required to bring it up to spec to turn it into a um, into a Club Med style resort. And it was launched in the early 1980s. I think uh, 1981, it was marketed as uh, Arus, A-R-O-U-S. Arus was the name of, the, of the, the speck of land, the village. It wasn't even a village, but it was a place, Arus. In fact, you can still find it on Google Maps if you know where to look. You go up the coast from Port Sudan, zoom in as close as possible. It's about 70 kilometers up from Port Sudan, it's still standing. And the Mossad produced brochures, glossy brochures advertising this place as, as a unique destination for adventurous holiday makers, diving enthusiasts. And they distributed these brochures in travel agents across Europe and further afield. And they started to attract guests. Guests came from all four corners of the world, from Britain, from America, from Australia. And a team of Mossad agents were recruited and they were former Navy SEALs. They had to have diving, you know, speciality. And they operated in the hotel as, as diving instructors, 
and other members of staff. And they catered for the guests and they mingled and they took the guests on excursions and diving expeditions. And by all accounts, it was a beautiful place to go on holiday. One of the things that um, I uh, uncovered was the original guest book, which the Mossad manageresses, they recruited uh, three ladies to be front of house, to lower suspicions, because if there, if there are women, well, if, it, if there were more than just men working there, it was lower suspicions. The Sudanese were very, very suspicious. It was, a, I said, it was a paranoid regime and they would send intelligence agents to check out this resort to make sure that uh, there wasn't anything uh, suspicious going on there. But um, one of the things which I, which I saw was the guest book. And it's quite remarkable, it's handwritten, names of the guests, and I tracked down half a dozen guests who had stayed there in the 80s. And I told them that I was researching for, for, for a book and I come across their names and they responded with absolute astonishment. And they all remembered having stayed there. And they, I remember they told me how they remembered it, especially because of how well run it was and the toned, the tanned and toned staff, the foreign staff who of course were all, all Mossad agents. And I have to, and then ultimately, you know, I told them that it was actually a Mossad front and they, 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 they reacted with astonishment, but every single one without fail, uh, expressed admiration for what the, the Mossad did in using it to smuggle uh, Jews to safety, which was which was you know really something lovely to hear. By day, the hotel would operate as a hotel, and at night time, the Mossad agents would gather. They'd go off in convoys of trucks to to uh, one of the large refugee camps called Gadaraf. Gadaraf was. Nine, about 900 kilometers, which is what, about 700 miles away. So this was a day and a half or a night and a half of driving along roads, which weren't even roads. Sudan had about three roads in those days. The conditions were absolutely uh, treacherous. And it was one of the most dangerous things that they did was to literally to drive on the roads there at night time. Uh, camel corpses they had to avoid and, and all, all manner of things. They would then rendezvous with Jews in the refugee camps who they had, the, you know, when I, when I spoke about the heroism belonging to Ethiopian Jews themselves, it's important to point out that there was a cell of young Jews, 16, 17 years old, that the Mossad had trained they got into the refugee camps the Mossad they trained this cell of young Ethiopian Jews to identify other Jews and gather them at night time to rendezvous with the Mossad to then be transported back to the coast and these young Jews who did this job these Ethiopian Jews 16 17 years old they forewent the opportunity to get out of there they stayed behind in order to fulfill the mission that they've been appointed to do and as I said the conditions this was like you know you talk about the bottom of the barrel this is b below the bottom of the barrel the accounts of what it was like to to, to 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 reside to languish in these refugee camps you can only imagine how bad it was so this operation continued they would transport the Jews from the camps to the coast uh, Israeli Navy vessel would anchor off the coast of, Sud of Sudan, out of sight. Navy SEALs and dinghies would then be dispatched from the mothership. They'd rendezvous with the Mossad and the Jews who they'd brought to the coast. The Israeli Navy divers would then take these Jews, transport them to the Navy ship, and the ship would then sail off to Israel. And then the, the agents would return to the hotel carry on as if nothing had happened. And incidentally, it wasn't just ordinary holiday makers who stayed there. It was, we're talking about diplomats as well, because there was, in Sudan, there was nowhere else for the diplomatic corps to go when they wanted a vacation. So they all gravitated towards this, this new hotel, which had opened on the coast. And these were ambassadors of not only countries which were friendly towards Israel, like the United States and Britain and France, but these were 
it included enemy Arab, uh, ambassadors from enemy Arab countries as well. Uh, the, the Iraqi ambassador was among those who would fraternize, not knowing he would fraternize with the Mossad agents. The Egyptian ambassador, uh, Egypt had just only very recently made a peace deal with Israel, but still very, very new, very untested, very cold peace. Egyptian ambassador was a frequent visitor to, to visitor to the hotel and he would he would play backgammon with the Mossad agents and he would talk quite liberally about this and that. At one time when the agents were making the, the transfer at night time on the coast to the to the dinghies, they were ambushed by a battalion of Sudanese soldiers who'd crept up on them. The soldiers, as it happened, didn't suspect that these were Mossad agents at all. They suspected that there was some smuggling going on because it was a well-known route from Sudan across the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. There was a lot of contraband which was smuggled. But an entire battalion of Sudanese soldiers surprised uh, the Mossad agents when they were at the point of transferring the Jews to the dinghies. One of the soldiers opened fire with his with automatic uh, gunfire. He, he raped the beach. Miraculously, not a single Jew, not a single person uh, was injured. The Jews managed to, managed to escape. The Mossad managed to defuse the situation and they carried on. But they changed the modus operandi. They abandoned or they, they paused the, uh, the evacuations by sea and they started to uh, carry out evacuations by air. They flew in Hercules aircraft under the cover of darkness at night time. The most dangerous type of flying that's almost possible to do. Just dozens of feet above sea level in order to avoid enemy radar in all kinds of uh, in all kinds of climatic climatic conditions. And when the Hercules arrived in Sudan, they had to skirt the Red Sea hills. This is a chain of mountains and land in complete darkness in the desert, not on an airstrip, but in the desert. And then they would rendezvous with the Mossad agents and the trucks carrying the Ethiopian Jews. They'd have 15 minutes with, with the propellers still running. They didn't even switch off the engine. 15 minutes to, to marshal the Jews into the into the hold of these huge aircraft and then the aircraft would turn around and fly them back to Israel. Remember I said that the Ethiopian Jews didn't even know what electricity was in many cases. I mean just to use your imagination here they were being being uh, told to go into the belly of these massive aircraft, the noise and the dust one of the Ethiopian Jews later described it as, as imagine himself like Jonah going to, into the belly of the whale. Now, I'm running short of time, but the operations which I'm talking about come under the, the title of Opera Operation Brothers. Operation Brothers was deliberately chosen to represent what this mission meant. Brothers, Operation Brothers and Sisters, but it was Operation Brothers because there was such a, a kindred, uh, a, a relationship that the agents felt towards the, the Jews, the black Jews, their brethren, that they, they turned to Operation Brothers because they were, they were their brothers. In 1985, there was a revolution in Sudan and the president was overthrown and a new leadership came to office and one of the first things that they did was, uh, well, well, they arrested a lot of the previous members of the regime, the members of the previous regime. And they learned through interrogation that there was a Mossad cell operating in the country. And in order to burnish their credentials in the Arab world, they sent out uh, teams to try to track down who these Mossad agents were and where they were where they were operating. Word got back to Mossad HQ in Tel Aviv that the, the operation was at risk of being exposed. 
and they ordered the agents to evacuate the diving resort with immediate effect. But this was Easter time and the hotel was full of guests. So the, most, the agents working there couldn't just abandon the place. It would be far too suspicious. So they had to hang on another five days or so until the last guest left. And the agents, there were about, I think, five, maybe six agents who were, who were still working there as staff. And they made their excuses to their, to their local staff because they also employed local Ethiopians and Eritreans to work there as well as, as, uh, as chambermaids, as waiters, as security guards, and so on and so forth. And they said, we're going up the coast for a couple of days. We'll be back. We're going to check out some new diving spots. And they packed all their belongings and their secret equipment into two, two Toyota land cruisers. They messaged Mossad HQ to say that they, they'd left the place. And by the way, when they left the resort on their way out, two new guests arrived and they said, just go on inside. We'll, we'll, we'll be back to sign you in. Of course, they never returned. Uh, the Mossad dispatched an emergency aircraft to airlift the agents from an assigned point in the desert. And they got them out in, just in the nick of time. The Mossad took with them on the aircraft the, the two Toyota vehicles, which they'd left the resort with. When they landed in Israel, they reversed the vehicles out of the aircraft. Those two Toyota vehicles were the only Toyotas in the whole of Israel because Toyota uh, was boycotting Israel because it wasn't, they weren't allowed to sell in the Arab world if they traded with Israel, but Mossad took these two vehicles. Op uh, Operation Moses occurred in 1985, just after the events which I'm I've been speaking about, and it's the very famous airlift which evacuated about 8,000 Jews over a period of weeks. But Operation Moses wouldn't have happened without Operation Brothers, which really set the stage. And there wouldn't be a single Ethiopian Jew in Israel these days if it wasn't for the heroism and the accomplishments of the Mossad and the Ethiopian Jews themselves. They were agents of their own fate. They took their own fate into their hands and without their own actions, none of this would have been possible. I mentioned at the outset that this, in the, by this, at the start of this mission, there were about 36,000 Jews in Ethiopia. Today in Israel, there's approximately 150,000, 150,000. And I think it's a testament to the success of these astonishing events that there is, that the community is thriving. The immigration minister in Israel, a lady called Penina Tamano Shatta, she's just been reappointed with the, under the new government. She's an Ethiopian born Jew who was smuggled to Israel around about the age of three in one of these missions. Her ancestor, and I'm going, to, I'm going to end on this point, one of her ancestors was an Ethiopian Jewish elder, they're called Kes, it's the equivalent of, of a rabbi, they're called Kes or Kesim. He went by the name of Abba Mahari. Abba Mahari lived in the 1800s, and in 1862, he took thousands of followers on an attempted journey to get from Ethiopia to the land of Jerusalem. Ultimately it failed, but thousands of Jews went on foot to try to get back to the land of their ancestors. And I think it's, it's, an, it's absolutely astonishing that fast forward to this present day, one of his descendants is now the Israeli, uh, actually she, she is the, um, Yes, she's the Minister of Immigration. Um, so just something, a point to, to dwell on there. I'm going to finish on that. So I'm glad I haven't overrun. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to find out the full story, then please do 
get the book because it's a story which really it should be incumbent on all Jews to know about. Thank you. Uh, Rafi, uh, thank you so much for, um, for what an amazing tale and um, for the passion behind which it's spoken. Just one second. Um, I think what you haven't really shared, I mean, I know you you kind of expressed the, what the amazement was that you didn't know about it, but um, you you obviously made this your passion. Um, you know, you, th this, this story is, is your story and that's come across. So a uh, yashikach to you for being the ambassador of this story, uh, a part of Jewish history that needed to be told. Um, and uh, you were the agent to be able to do so. So uh, really quite incredible. Um, this is an opportunity for anyone who has any questions. Um, Rafi uh, also didn't share that the information that he has was given to him um, exclusively um, by, the, by, by, by the inner core um, on condition that he would keep to um, to be the, the for, for the portrayal to be exactly as it took place. Um, so if you think anything is incredible, it's because everything's incredible. Uh, but this is the opportunity to to ask any questions. So we have a couple of moments. Please feel free to unmute and, and any questions you might want to ask at this time. Uh, Rafi, while we're waiting, if anyone um, wants to share any questions. Um, can I just ask, in terms of myself, why do you think that, no, that none of the Ethiopian Jews um, who living in Israel took upon themselves to, to publicize the story in the way that it's only come about now? Well, I think uh, the answer to that is really, it was, um, it was the advent of the, of the Netflix movie that really brought this to, to public awareness. Um, when, when I met the commander, Danny, um, he had, uh, he had worked in a as a consultant on the script in a, in a limited capacity, and uh, I, I put to him the idea of writing the book, and he said, "Well, you know, it just so happens that at this at this moment in time, he's been thinking he uh, he, he wanted doc to document the actual story because the Netflix movie is 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 a piece of Hollywood. It's you know it's kind of tells very 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 loosely." uh what what happened but it's it, a lot of it is fictitious and he was concerned that uh it would you know the the, the, the true uh facts would just be m muddied and uh it's quite fortuitous that i came along at that moment in time and his criteria uh one of his criteria to me for uh participating for for partnering me on this this project was that it had to be an authentic story and that everything that's in the book needed to be verifiable and uh, nothing uh, nothing invented mm. uh, but it's uh, it's quite astonishing because it's it, it's you know you talk about stories where fact is stranger than fiction well this this really certainly is so you know i think a lot of people just didn't listen to the ethiopian jews about the stories because you know people have got other things to do preoccupied with with other things but it really the story one when, when it's told uh, fully it really captures people's imagination which is why it's it's taken off in in, in the way that it has has there been any thoughts about uh, the, the the story being translated into Ivrid or Amaric for um for the Ethiopian community yeah one of my um ambitions at the outset was to get it translated into uh, into Hebrew and uh, it was uh, it was quite a struggle uh, actually. It wasn't. I mean, I've, I had uh, interest from other languages, including Hungarian. It was translated into Hungarian and Russian. And actually, recently, uh, it's just been bought by uh, a Hebrew publisher called Shoken Books, uh, which is a very large, uh, well-known Israeli publisher. So, uh, before long, it will come out in in Hebrew uh, in, in Israel, which I'm very very pleased about. Fantastic. David, did you want to ask a question? If you're frozen. No. OK. 
Okay. Um, does anyone else have, while waiting for David to unmute, anyone else have, um, yes, um, uh, Martin. Are there any Jews left in Ethiopia now? That's a good question. Uh, there, there, there are um, Jews who are known as the Falashmura. Falashmura <coughs> are the descendants of those uh, Jews who were forcibly converted by Christian missionaries in, in the late 1800s. And they, because they are not considered to be halachically Jewish, they are only allowed to uh, settle in Israel under the uh, law of entry, which uh, allows family, reun family reunifications. And uh, there's an operation, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, which was launched um, quite recently to bring these Falashmora to Israel. And about 2,000 of approximately, I think about 9,000 have so far come. So there are, there is an operation underway to bring the remaining Jews to Israel, but you know it's, we're talking about altogether different conditions now. Israel and Ethiopia you know, have have perfectly friendly relations, uh, so uh, it's you know it's 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 quite uh, quite an easy thing. Thank you, Martin. Um, Thank you, Henry. Do you have a question? Or or I just wanted to ask a question. Many, many years ago, probably 30 years ago, we went to a place called Pom, where the Ethiopian Jewish lads were being trained with some sort of handiwork and how to work and how to get jobs. Does that place still exist? What's it, what's it called? Pom, T-O-M. Um, where? In, in, in Israel? Yes, in Mary. Israel. Mary, we can't hear you. Sorry, Mary. You have to be next to the mic. Sorry, uh, Mary. You have to be next to the microphone. I, I assume it's in Israel that you mean, Tom. Yes, yeah. in Israel. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, I, I, short answer is it's not a place I've heard of, so I, I, I can't comment on it uh, whether it's still there or not. Yep. But, but um, you know, the, we hear, we hear. Uh, so, well, now, a lot of the time we hear about Ethiopian Jews in Israel, it's 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 for negative reasons. It's either to do with discrimination or poverty or, you know, one thing or another, protests. But what's l talked about less is the accomplishments exactly. that they've achieved and the, the astonishing levels of success that they've also risen to. Uh, you know, I gave the example of the Ethiopian immigration minister, but you find Ethiopian Jews in at the, at, at the highest levels of every walk of life you can imagine academia in the but civil society in, in the world. army in the police it's uh, you know they're, they're a very resourceful uh, very dignified uh, remarkable section of, of the Jewish community the question uh, perhaps you would know was Ivrit a language that the Ethiopian Jews knew when they when they davened? Did they daven in 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 in, um, in Ivrit or in Hebrew, or, or did they not have that language? Uh, that's a really good question. They they didn't know Hebrew until uh, un, until the uh, the early twentieth century. Uh, they they prayed in uh, their their form of Torah was called the Orit O R I T. And they prayed in Gaze. Gaze is the uh, the liturgical language. It was also used by Christians, uh, but they did not know Hebrew, which is a remarkable thing, until it was introduced to them, and uh, they they started to uh, they started to adopt it. But um, you know, they where they split off at, at, from the rest of the Jewish world at a time in history before. You know, we were talking about pre-Talmudic times as well, so they, they had no tradition of the oral law either. So their form of Judaism, which is, you know, it, it is as it is equal, equally legitimate as it's a category of Judaism, but, but it's different to the form of Judaism that we that we know and we practice. But there, but the, you know, they, they they followed a very uh, biblical form of Judaism, and as I said, it was it was absolutely scrupulous. Uh, 
kashrut and 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 uh, cleanliness as well was uh, all the laws they they uh, they really observed uh, to the letter. It's uh, their adherence to Judaism was just absolutely remarkable. David, um, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi. It's not it's not really quick. Um, great talk. Thank you very much, Rafi. Um, whilst I've been listening to you, I notice your book is on. It's on Amazon anyway, hardback 1106, which seems a really reasonable <laughs> price to me. Also on Audible, I've just ordered your book, read by a guy called Peter Noble. So I hope he does That's as right. good a job as you have convincing me. Um, you, you know, I, I've definitely gone for it in a big way. So thanks very much for your talk. It's great. I'm just putting the advert out there on your behalf. That's very, very kind. I didn't pay you uh, to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I thought you were going to say, I see your book is behind you. Uh, which which it is. Um, and this is this is uh, this is what it looked like. Um, and if, if I if I could even actually plug myself, the um, uh, the head of uh, education at um, in the United Synagogue actually uh, said it's 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 a a book which should be on every Jewish bookshelf, which I'm very very proud of. Uh, and I'm saying that not not because not to sell copies, but you know, I'm speaking to you tonight because I, I pretty much take every opportunity I can to share this this story because it's 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 a part of our shared heritage. Now, I didn't know about it beforehand, but it's it's you know to to learn about not just what the Mossad did, but about Ethiopian Jews. What a rich history! What a fantastic, incredible set of people they are is is just something which you know as Jewish people we 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 it should be. It should be something that we know and, and know about and respect them for. Well, Rafi, I'm not going to ask you um, when I got my signed copy, how many people had gotten copies before me, but uh, I'll just assume <laughs> I was of the first handful. But um, Richard, did you want to ask something? Uh, yeah, there were a couple of things I just wanted to say. Um, when I was at um, school in the 1980s, um, I was at Hasmane and we had the opportunity to meet one of the um, Ethiopian rabbis. Um, and he came and addressed the school. And one of the things that stuck in my mind about one of the things he said, he said lots of things, was how, the, how they had to integrate um, the, uh, the Jews that settled in Israel into the, uh, what was uh, then the 20th century. Um, and he said even something as basic as climbing stairs, he said they'd never you had adults that never climbed stairs before, they'd never needed to. You know, it's this idea that, you know, that, um, that, that um, they were going out on a plane, you know, the, you know, the whole thing was from, from their perspective, uh, was just, um, I suspect as wondrous as, um, you know, uh, leaving, um, you know, the Jews leaving in Egypt in the first place, you know, so um, he said we had no, we, we would have had no idea just how much um, of an upheaval um, leaving Ethiopia would have been uh, for them. Um, and I remember getting, coming home and um, uh, my grandfather uh, was living with us at the time and, and telling him of, the, of uh, this talk. And he and it prompted him to say that um, he said the first time he'd ever seen somebody of colour in the East End of London was it was seeing two Ethiopian Jews. This is in the 1920s, I have to say, yeah. davening in the in the Great Synagogue. Yeah. Now I have no idea whether it was true or not. But I can't believe he'd have said something that wasn't true. And he said he he said that there were um, there, there were certainly uh, black Jews in London when he was growing up, he said, because it was it was the only time he'd ever seen them until much later in his life. So uh, uh, that, said, that, uh, that, that could that may well have been. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's true. Um, what I spoke about um, the French uh, Jewish scholar Joseph Halevi, who, who, who really put who really who made the first contact with Ethiopian Jews, um, a, a student of his uh, called um, uh, Jacques Faitlevich uh, in the early 1900s. He kind of picked up the mantle and, and it was Jacques Faitlevich who really put Ethiopian Jews in, in, on, on the map and in terms of uh, creating awareness of them in, 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 in Europe. And uh, he, he brought uh, some uh, Jewish students, young children from Ethiopia, Jews, uh, to study and to learn and to train. And he brought them, he brought them from Ethiopia 
uh, to to Europe, uh, and, and then also uh, in Palestine, uh, Israel, in those days. And so he may well have uh, brought them to London as well. And they, they could have been uh, easily could have been a part of his uh, his group of students who, who your grandfather saw uh, davening in, in in the shul there. Amazing. So what was quite, so what quite plausible. Have, so what would have happened to them afterwards? Would they have they, those that came to Europe? Would they have yeah. settled here or? No, they, they spent a period of time uh, learning uh, in, in Europe and, and, and in Israel, and then they, they returned uh, to uh, uh, Ethiopia to, to be leaders of their, of their community. Um, Rita, we're, we're moving towards the end of, um, so I wanted to make sure that you get your question in. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, I might be wrong. Going back, my two children went to Je Oh, am I yet? I'm, I'm yeah. muted, yeah. My two, my two children went to JFS. They used to go, with Joe Regiment was head, they used to go to give at Washington. Was that where Ethiopian children were studying? Or am I wrong? Give at? Give at Washington, it was called. Um, I, I heard of it. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It doesn't, doesn't really mean, okay. mean, mean anything to me. If, if I may, you're correct there, Rita, and, um, and and this was after this was after they were being absorbed into Israeli society. They, yeah. uh, they would attend it. different schools and different um, uh, youth villages. And when I was in JFS, I went to the later incarnation, which was Yemen Ord. And spent oh, five months. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thought, uh, the younger one to, went to Yemen Ord, and the older one went to the yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 men or I, I know about. Yeah, and the previous one I think was by Washington. Anyway, I might be wrong as well. I don't know. Quite a few years ago, and then. If I may also add, I have a rabbi who went to spend Pesach in Ethiopia a couple of years ago, and um, and he, you know, brought Pesach to this far off remote village, um, and ended up uh, organizing for three um post grads as it were from this village to come and study in israel and even now in in 2020 i think when they moved over to israel they didn't know about alarm clocks they didn't know about many of the amenities that that people have nowadays there were so many things that they still don't know about over there that, that are a, a natural part of our lives but which are still very much unknown so can i, can I just mention you you spoke about um uh, pesach um in my talk, I, I mentioned that there was a uh, the ORT, which was a the char charitable organization uh, operating in Ethiopia in the 1970s. Uh, there was a Jewish representative there. Uh, he, he brought uh, pieces of matzah to uh, one of the Ethiopian Jewish communities there for Pesach, because Ethiopian Jews they they practiced a form of Pesach, not 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 the seder that uh, that we that we do, but uh, he he brought them. Um, a uh, box of matzah, and the the matzah he told me was confiscated by the by the Ethiopian authorities because they didn't know what it was, and they suspected that it was some kind of a listening device. It's a piece of matzah. Can you imagine a listening device? But um, last question, Darren. If we could, uh, please feel free. Yeah, just to follow on from what was said before, I was actually in Give Up, Washington. Uh, I was one of those students. Uh, I was there in 1984, and it, it was the first, one of the first ever uh, extractions of, of Ethiopian. There were young girls that came over that all of a sudden, one day, this group of girls appeared in our school, and we were told these are the first people that have come out, rescued from Ethiopia, but don't tell anyone. It was all a big secret. But it was amazing to think that, you know, we were one of the first people to ever see these people that were rescued there at that time. So yes, that was Give Up Washington, and it was uh, just outside of Ashdod. Yeah. Um, Dar Darren, I'm not sure you were supposed to give away the secret, but by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was quite an amazing thing that I, you know, I remember. You know, we, we we went into the school one day, and then there was this group of girls that were there, and they honestly looked bewildered by everything around them. Obviously, coming to a uh, a modern western area they weren't used to thank you darren um, i think we're going to move towards 
um, our concluding thoughts at, the, um, at this moment. Um, first of all, um, Rafi, a, a massive thank you to um, to you for um, for all the research you've done and, and specifically for for sharing with with us this amazing story and bring and bringing it all to light and um, and I certainly echo um, that sentiment that this is a, a a book that either should be belong on every Jewish bookshelf or every Jewish um, iPhone depending on your version of how how, how you how you hold books these days um, and uh, you know I I certainly hope. Uh, the, the enthusiasm that, that you've put into into this will um, will 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 in really ensure that, that this um, becomes part of the 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 one of the most um, important stories in modern times of of an emerging people um, returning back to their ancestral homeland, um, our homeland, um, under Operation of Brothers. Um, and thank you so much for, for coming and joining with us for this evening. Um, it really, really has been absolutely fabulous. Um, and as you said, sometimes in these rare cases, the truth um, is so much more amazing than any, any fiction. But this is what we believe as a people. Am Yisrael Chai, um, we are a people that are that are capable of the miraculous and because we believe in ourselves believe, we believe in us and we believe in our destiny uh, as well so thank you very much for, for joining us um I, I i just want to as we conclude the series as well um to say a massive yashikayach to to rabbi nick for um for organizing in the last three weeks and um, so amazingly um and if i can try to um, use my rabbinical power um, to um, force him onto the stage. Look at that, unbelievable. You can literally drag people these days. Um, you know, Rab Rabbi Nick has uh, um, really led um, and and carved out this this unique um, and uh, amazing um, Dear to Dream series. Um, just one of, one of the phenomenal things um, that he's that, that he has spearheaded for for our community recently. So massive yashikayach. Um, to him for um, for putting it all together and the high caliber of each of the sessions and leaving us all on a super high um, as well. We are going into the three weeks now. Um, this coming Sunday evening, I'll be giving a share on Zoom um, about um, uh, uh, what I'm calling good morning, um, which um, is a play on words of uh, go, a, a good way to go into a morning period, M-O-R, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, um, and a bit of an understanding about, a deep understanding about the three weeks and significance. And also next coming Tuesday, I'll be in conversation uh, with Rabbi Daniel Friedman from, um, from, from, Hampstead Garden Suburb Synagogue, when we will be discussing one of Rabbi Sachs's um, uh, um, Zatzal's um, books called One People, Traditions, Modernity, and Jewish Unity, um, which will also be featured um, on Zoom as well um, for um, for us to have a bit of an insight and understand to one of his books, plus looking now towards uh, towards Tisha B'Av, the Sunday program as well. Lots going on as always, and we thank everyone because it's only because of you guys attending um, that we are able to have these sessions. So yashikar to all of you who have enjoyed the talks and, um, and we've enjoyed your presence and looking forward to more education in Bushy Synagogue and wishing everyone a very good evening. Good night, everyone.